All right, my friends, thanks again for joining us. What is this, like week nine or 72 or 150? I don't know. I don't know how many weeks we've been here. Um, but today uh, we have Nick S. Smith, who is the president of IEPPV, who's going to show us how he does his splashes and crashes and drop photography, but he's going to be using solenoids. So last week we had David Swanson do it, a little bit more of the, the home setup kind of brand. He had a cup and he had some cool PVC and things like that. And this this week, what we're going to do is, is Nick is going to show the complicated and complex, but yet very intricate control system that we have uh, set up for that. So my name is Troy Miller. Those of you that know me, I'm the, the creator of F64 Live, which for those of you that, that are listening to this near and dear to um, May, June, July is going to be in September 12th and 13th. The 12th will be all digital. And that's great because we're going to be able to span uh, the globe with our guests. And we're going to be teaming up with uh, Frederick Van Johnson from This Week in Photo to do that. And then day two, the 13th, is going to be live. Maybe smaller. We don't know. But check out F64Live.com to check that out. Nick will be there. Uh, a bunch of us will be there. It'll be fun. So, Nick, with that, let me cancel my spotlight. We're going to go ahead and pop over to you. Uh, tell us a little bit about... You know, if anybody watched the last YouTube interview that I did with David Swanson, uh, his was his was a much more simpler setup, right? Less sophisticated. Why the system that you have? Why is it different? How is it better? How is it more not not as good? Like, tell us a little bit about it. Okay, so first and foremost, this is the geeky solution. It's a half geeky solution because there's even more geeky if you really want to go there. But um, the big difference between what Dave is doing and what I'm doing is that the by using a solenoid valve, I can control the very precise timing of when the drops come down. So I can have, instead of photographing just a single drop and um, you know seeing... Uh, where it goes, which can be pretty cool. I can let go multiple drops. And in fact, some of the shots that we'll see will be using three drops. Uh, so the first drop comes down and creates a, a splash. And then as it bounces back, you get a column of water come up. And that's all the stuff that Dave was shooting. And then he does some really cool lighting on that. The second drop comes down, crashes into that, and creates a splash across, you know, creates a kind of a, a sort of flower look across the top of the image. And then I've got a third drop coming down. And if I get it right, I have the third drop hanging just above the, the first and second. So you've got three drops in play. Now, if you really want to go the stage further, then you go to the route that people like Kip and Alton Vance have. You paid 10 times what I've paid, which is 10 times what Swanson paid. And then you have three separate solenoids. I'm dealing with one, and we'll talk about some of the challenges with that as we get in. So the goal the goal with this is, uh, we're with Swanson, if you guys haven't seen that, that video that we did, it's on the... Uh, F64 Live YouTube channel. It's also on the IEPPV YouTube channel in a playlist called Education. You can see that there. But in David's David's case, it was like, watch the drip, hit the button. Okay, maybe I got it, maybe I didn't. In your case, you can control all that timing, right? You can control right. when the camera fires and hopefully where the drop is at the time that that yep. camera fires. That's the whole goal, right? Is control. The goal is absolutely that. And so instead of uh, you know, getting really good at timing my shutter, I get very patient at uh, you know getting the computer to time it. But once I have the shot dialed in, it's repeatable, and it will continue to do the same thing or approximately the same thing every time. So then you can just churn out a whole bunch of images. Now each splash is different. Each splash is its own unique flower. I mean, uh, and when you see them, quite literally, it's own unique flower. But right. but um, it's that once you've got the thing going, then you you know it becomes repeatable. Got it. Okay. So do you want to, you want to jump in and I know you've got a, you've got multiple cameras set up there and you've got a bunch of uh, different information. So let's just kind of have an overview of what a system that you're, that you're talking about looks like. Sure. Okay. So if we switch to my overview camera here, this is the overall setup and obviously it starts off with a the camera. Uh, there's a tray. I'm going to step back here. Um, so I've got a tray of water, and for the moment, I've got a bolt in there. And, uh, those of you that watched uh, the uh, presentation that Do uh, Troy did with David will know that Troy believes in bolts for focus. And that's a really <laughs> cool idea. I stole the idea. I plagiarized it shamelessly. But really, the magic is in this dropper valve. And actually, if I just zoom in for a second, um, Fred, it's not a video head, so apologies for the sort of non-nice uh, non smooth uh, zooms. But if you have a look at what you see here, this guy is really the thing that does the magic. And it's just a little 
um, solenoid valve with a control circuit that then gets controlled by the Pluto trigger. And then above it, if I just zoom out a little bit, you have this column, and there's a name for this, and I completely forgot what it is. But basically, for as long as your, the water level is above the top of that inner tube, the pressure at the valve is consistent. So you get totally consistent drop sizes. Once it drops below there, then it starts to get a little, you know, a little squirrely. And until you've emptied the water out of the tube, it's squirrely. But in that middle section, you've got very, very repeatable uh, tube. And all of the dropper mechanisms that you see, whether it be this one or whether it be the big complex ones uh, you know, with multivalves, they all use that same technique uh, to, just to maintain the consistent dropping. Beyond that, then, uh, there's the Pluto trigger, which I will pull out. It's hidden behind the camera. Um, it uses... Um, infrared to fire the camera because it doesn't have enough connection. So it's just this little guy here. Um, and you'll see one connection goes off to one of the, uh, to the strobe trigger, and that's firing my flashes. Uh, and then the other one uh, goes off to the dropper valve, and then it uses infrared to fire the, the, the camera, which is why it's kind of you know, MacGyvered to sit in front of the uh, infrared receiver on the camera. So can you, if, can you show us how your lights are set up a little bit? Is it similar to what David did? Are you lighting a background that reflects the I am lighting the a background, yes. The, so, uh, you know what, I can, I can take your walkabout and I can do that. Um, well, that's fine. I mean, yeah, I can see what you've got, you got there. Okay, so. So, so the primary light, I mean, if we walk back here, this, uh, this uh, sheet here is a sheet of what's called Translum, which is basically transparent plastic. And in fact, if I just lift that up, and I'll fold that up like this, then you'll see behind it, ooh, You'll see behind it, I've got a, a you know, big strobe. Okay. And this is a 600 watt, uh, watt second strobe running at um, 128th power in order to give me uh, a very, very short um, flash so duration. So essentially, you're doing the same thing that David did, is, is we're making sure that the light is on the background because the background is going to reflect Correct. in the water. And that's actually what we're photographing is the reflection. So exactly. that's, that's cool. Yeah. So that's a, that's a unique way to do that, right? So the other thing I've also got off to the left-hand side is I then have this black cloth, and that black cloth gives the edges of the uh, droplets something to look at. So you then see the black edges. It's exactly the same as if you were shooting glass uh, in a commercial shoot, that you've got black on one side, and that then gives you a nice dark edge um, uh, with the light. Now, there's one other piece that you'll see from the photograph that Troy just pulled up earlier, which is I then have some red um, film that I can drop down behind the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the translum, and that'll allow us to make everything go nice and red. Uh, yeah, so I'm showing that yeah, image right now, a, so, yeah, so we can see that. Okay, that's cool. But we're going to do a couple of shots without that first, because it's actually kind of cool without it. It's, um, it's quite literally black and white. And uh, I know uh, I'm a big fan of black and white as well, Troy. So, uh, so in that solenoid, can yep. you put in different kinds of fluid? Like, can it only be water, or can I put in glycerin or glycerol? I could definitely put in glycerin. Um, anything that's not going to completely mess it up, basically. Okay. I mean, it's just a valve. All right. And uh, the, the path through it is big enough that you could put, I mean, you could run milk or, uh, you know, mm. glycerin or, uh, you know, uh, and colored dye, dye stuffs and so on. Okay, I haven't that's... done that yet. That's kind of my next step, but. Okay, that's what I was going to ask too. Is that there's no yeah. reason why you couldn't put a uh, food coloring in there to make that that drip maybe yellow, and then you drip it into something, yep. whatever. So you could you could you could exactly. play with that. All right, and that's yeah. where that's where the artistic side of it comes in. Like this is all mechanical, exactly. even though the splashes yep. are going to be unique because of the way the fluid dynamics are. But you could play with it. You know, you could mix colors in there and yeah, do all kinds of cool stuff. All right. So before we get to playing with that. Um, Tell us, tell us a little bit about uh, how you got to playing with this. Like, what got you interested in this in the first place? Where did that creative moment start for you? Playing with somebody else's toys. <laughs> how, how, do we, how do we get to play with anything? You play with someone else's toys, and you say, I want that toy. And so you go and get it. Yeah. Um, we did a, a workshop a while back with uh, Frank and uh, set up at Alton Vance's church. And he's got the really, he's got the high end system that, you know, the, th this is, this is the, the middle version. So his system has three separate solenoids, and, um, you know, each solenoid is dropping a single drop. And he uses that to be able to create a taller column. He uses two drops together to produce a taller column and then the flower on top. But it was just, I really enjoyed it. I always wanted to play with one of those. And so, uh, you know, I talked to my beloved and uh, eventually she decided to give me a photo <laughs> trick for Christmas. How else does it work? And uh, how, much, how much do you have, uh, what would it cost to get that set up with the trigger, 
the solenoid, the single solenoid, you know, all the electronics that you have, they're not including your light and everything. It's, uh, I, I want to say under $200. Um, oh, okay. It's probably about $150, 200 It's not hugely expensive. Uh, I mean, it's obviously, it's money, but I mean, yeah, so probably a couple hundred bucks, if, if I remember. And that's for the Pluto trigger, the solenoid, the arm that holds it, and it comes with this nice clamp arm that holds it. Um, and th those are really the, the, the major three parts. There's a little stand you can put that on and so on. Now, I've obviously got things like C-stands and other stuff to support everything, which doesn't come in that price. Uh, so but, does that come in like no. one kit? I mean, what I'll, what I'll do is just uh, I'll go ahead and put some of that stuff in the YouTube description yeah. for those that are, that are interested. So that's good. I, I mean, I was thinking that this might be a ridiculous. I didn't know if this was something that you pieced together yourself or if it was like a kit that you could buy and, and kind of turnkey. So I was going to do that. I was going to piece, uh, you know, uh, piece me up together. You can get the solenoids. I mean, you can get the solenoids on eBay for under twenty bucks. Um, oh, wow. And then with an Arduino and a little bit of magic and some programming, you could do the same thing. Um, and then Pluto came out with the Pluto trigger and this valve, and suddenly it, the whole thing became uh, doable for a very reasonable price. And um, you know, uh, at a point that it, it wasn't worth going through all that effort. You know, I mean, if the, the three valve setup with the Cognosis is probably somewhere between twelve and fifteen hundred bucks. And that was more than I'm. I mean, I like toys, but you know, the, there's toys and there's toys, and that was just a bit too right. much. Right. So that's why I was going to go that way. But this, I mean, at, at the price, it's it's within the reach of, of you know reasonable. Well, plus the Pluto trigger is can be used for a lot more than just this, right? Oh Because yeah. you can do all you can do laser sound trigger, uh, all kinds of different triggers for it. So yeah, so it comes with a bunch of other little bits and pieces. Um, that's scattered around. Oh yeah, yeah. So it comes with its own little laser, uh, like this guy. I won't shine it at the okay. camera because that would be rude. But um, and then it comes. It's got a sound trigger. It's got an infrared trigger. Uh, it's got a. Um, and it's got, oh, it also has a lightning trigger. And I'm not sure whether that's electromagnetic or uh, optical, but right. I know that I know people have used that to, to good effect. I haven't yet. And you know, um, what, beyond this, one of my next stops is going to be just is going to be to start playing with with drops of dropping things into a liquid mm -hmm. and rather than doing that with timing i want to do that with the you know using the um the laser and, uh, and yeah. you know, just have it time it from when it cuts the beam because that so way again cool it becomes that, repeatable. that your investment isn't only to do water drops that that right. pluto trigger can be yeah. used for a ton of other things so yep. that's good that's that always helps justify the additional costs <laughs> of gear right <laughs> Like, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not only can we photograph it, but we could eat it later if we really needed to. Yeah. <laughs> not quite sure we can get that far, but then we can try, I guess. <laughs> okay. So let's let's go back to looking at your set and let's just sort of sure. walk through quickly like how you set uh, up the, the water, the tray, okay. how do we focus the camera, you know, those things, just like the basic yep. walkthrough for somebody who's maybe never seen it. Sure. I think Kip needs help, though. Kip is in here, and you know he forgets stuff a lot. <laughs> Kip needs help in many ways, but that's a separate <laughs> issue. Kip's a very special man. He's a good friend, and I like him. Yeah, don't be mean. Don't be mean. Sorry, Kip. I looked up, and you were the first name I saw, so so I pick on you. <laughs> Peter's not okay, here, so what am I going to do? <laughs> You know, let me. I'm going to switch to manual focus just so that we can. Uh, I can focus exactly where I want to be. Give me a second. Yeah. And there we go. And oh, look, there's a bolt. So now you've got the the the, uh, the bolt there, and um, uh, I'm online. Don't I'm presenting. Uh, Sally just says hello, by the way. Oh, hello. She just, just head in. Uh, so um, what I'm uh, I'll zoom in on the the bolt, and and Troy, Troy mentions the bolt in jest, but actually the reality is it's very very important, and it doesn't have to be the bolt. I used to use a um, just a, a wooden uh, kitchen skewer. Uh, and lay it across the tray, and that works pretty well. But the only trouble is, if you get it in the wrong place, the, the drops tend to knock it out of place. So um, it, it can be a bit hit and miss. But what I'm going to do here is the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to move the Pluto trigger out of the way so the camera doesn't shoot. Um, and I'm just going to drop, run some drops. And my goal, if you see, the drops were landing directly on the bolt. Now that took some time, but I thought it would be boring to watch doing that, so I've done that for you already. But by doing that, I know that my drops, because my drops are landing on my bolt, if, if my bolt's in focus, there's a pretty good chance that my um, everything else will be in focus. So if I switch over to live view, now you can actually see um, the, the bolt and, hey oh, presto, nice. we are now nicely in focus. Yep. So at this point, there's at least a fighting chance that our drops will be in focus as well. And um, 
So, you know, the one third in front, two thirds behind is kind of tricky um, to get precise, but uh, so I just focus on the front of the bolt and I figure that's probably going to call it good. Yeah. But essentially at that point, sir? Yeah, then you just do a couple shots yeah. and see. Cause... Exactly. Yep. So we see what we look like, and then if I just put this back in place. Now, for whatever reason, it normally takes two shots to get everything woken up. So the first one, the flash probably won't fire. The second one, the camera won't go. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get a shot. There we go. Nice. And, uh, so, so now, go ahead. That's how, that's how you get the bolt, get it focused. But yep. can we let, let's step back a minute. How are you firing the trigger? And sure. the camera. I mean, I mean, unless unless you're going to get there, like I'm just curious, like that whole. Yeah, no, setup. I, I can go through that. So the fo the focus is 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 one of the critical parts. Um, the tray itself is just a paint tray, um, you know, Home Depot special. The only problem I had with it was that the bottom was shiny, and uh, and not flattened, so you could see that pattern coming through the water. And that was not the end of the world, but it just wasn't ticky pretty. So what I did instead was I put a piece of black aluminum foil. Um, across the bottom, just so you've got something that's black and non-reflective. And um, of course, when I did that, uh, uh, half the water came out, and I was very glad that I'd put the uh, plastic over the table, the wooden table. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, it's important not to have anything that dislikes water close to this thing, because things will get wet. Fortunately, the camera not. Now, I'm using a macro lens, and I'm fairly close in. I mean, you know, as you see, it's a 90mm macro. so. Um, and I wanted to get fairly close, so I do need a very large depth of focus, which is why I'm shooting at, where are we? We're at f20. Um, and right. I wouldn't normally go that small, but it's frankly, it's the, on, the only option, it's the only game in town with this lot. So the next part then is to, to suspend the trigger by some mechanism. And again, I've used one of the sort of, you know, bendy arm, uh, uh, doohickeys, um, cause it, you know, just cause I had one, but, um, I'll zoom in on a little bit of what we've got up here. And there we go. And let me just clamp that up and then I can come and point things out. So the bracket, the... We're only seeing the bolt at the moment. Oh, you are? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now you see it. Ah, uh, now we see a brackety thing. All right. There we go, brackety thing. <laughs> okay. Did that come with um, the Pluto trigger kit? No, the... the okay. Right, so this, this, pit, this bracket piece here, that all comes as part of the kit, and it's, okay. one, it's one okay. of the pieces that they have. And then they also have a little tripod base onto which you can screw. This is a standard quarter 20, so you can just put it onto any tripod. Yeah, okay. um, and that's good enough for most things. You know, put it on a pile of boxes or whatever, and you can create a setup just with that. Since I have the bendy arm and the super clamp, uh, I just clamp that onto the same um, C-stand that's holding up the, the translum just because it was easier. But the, the idea is that basically you want the bolt held up, and it's about, I found about 12 inches above the water. 10, 10 to 12 inches is about right. I was playing around last night with nearly two foot, and the, you don't get any significant increase in the height of the bounce because the, the droplets have essentially reached thermal velocity. Right. The timing gets harder. Uh, you have to have the shutter open longer. It's just, it, it becomes more challenging. So this seems to be you know, a good setup, and the only way to get there is trial and error. It's just you know, literally just suck it and see, see what works, play with it, uh, and so on. So, but that's a good starting point too. So that's yeah. good. It's a it's a great starting point. And then obviously, you know, putting some water in the top. I found that the um, I'm using the deep end of the tray, and having the water level right up to the uh, up to the edge of the tray helps because otherwise you get extraneous bits of tray showing in the image, uh, and it means I can see the ripples. And then I've got the, the ripples right at the front of the tray so that I can have the back and the background as far away as possible to get them to go soft, well as soft as you can go when you're at f20, which yeah. is not one very of the good. one of the trays that I that I liked a lot, and it's big and and hard to manage, but it's a drip tray. It's a big uh, oil drip tray. You get it automotive. They're usually four oh, foot. Like four foot there are maybe a quarter of an inch deep uh spray painted black and then you have an enormous amount of real estate you do have to put it on a piece of plywood though because it's very flexy yeah. and bendy but yeah. then... no i like that idea i was looking around to see what i had that was bigger and i didn't have anything bigger i think uh, swanson was using a developing tray wasn't he uh he was yeah he was using a developing it looked tray. like that. i thought i recognized that. i remember those yeah. And I don't have any. Um, so, okay. But, so uh, we have our solenoid clamped. We have, that's above our tray. Our tray's full of yep. water. 
Uh, we've got a yep. cable connected to this thing. And where does this cable go? This goes back to the, cable, the trigger. So the cable from the device goes in straight into the Pluto trigger. The Pluto has two inputs. And, um, can we see that? Can we see the Pluto trigger? Uh, yes, we can. I will do, I actually, let me do this. Um, oddly enough, the best way to show. No, that's not it. That's the app. Um, let me see. I don't know if the camera will focus this close, but uh, probably not. Uh, let me see. I'm back on. Am I back? Yeah, I'm back on autofocus. I'm not sure that it will focus that that close. Let me see if I can uh, just switch over to the live view, and uh, we can refocus again afterwards. But if you see here, um, you come in and focus. Uh, where are we? There we go. No, we see a bolt. No, you now you see inputs. We see a bolt. You see bolt. We see a bolt. Uh, oh, why do you see a bolt? Uh, I don't know. You're the one switching the camera. <laughs> I am. You should be seeing live view. Oh, live view is frozen. Uh, a minute, you'll see my hand holding the Pluto trigger. There we go. So I'm not very good at holding a still bit. You can see it's got essentially there's a USB for charging, and then the trigger on the the one on the left is what I'm using to drive the um, solenoid, and then the one on the right is what I use to drive the flash. Oh, okay. And okay. then okay, perfect. All right. And then how do? And we... then it's got it's got a little oh, you know, okay. couple of lights and so on. So right. that's the that's the setup um, for the device. And literally they just plugged in there, you know, two and a half mil um, jacks, and you just just plug them in and away you go. Uh, now, what I'm doing for my lights is I actually have that um, that uh, cable plugged into the um, uh, input, uh, the sort of um, you know trigger socket on my um, remote trigger, wireless trigger, so that it should then fire uh, the, the flash. I can, uh, I'll do it in a minute. Okay, so we go back to the the setup. So um, I'll come back around to the whole of the setup here and. It's not the bull head. Uh, this all gets a little MacGyvered, but if you see, there's a Godox trigger tucked under the um, uh, uh, the spider grip of the uh, camera, um, and that that's this guy here. So this is so what's when you actually fire the camera. The yeah. So when you fire the camera, it's yeah. firing your strobe. Correct. So yeah. So okay. So that's just well, that's. But it's it's the the key is it's the Pluto trigger that fires the strobe, not the camera. So what's firing the camera? The camera is being fired by the Pluto trigger. The Pluto trigger has at its front mm -hmm. this little, if you can see that little bulby bit there. Nope. Um, no, let's turn it around the right way. That little bulby bit there, that is an infrared emitter. We don't that see drive, that. That fires the trigger. Can you see that? It's a little dark. No, it's way, um, you're, yeah, you're zoomed in too tight. Uh, oh, am I? OK. Oh, yeah. Uh, there we go. Um, mm -hmm. So that yeah, that little bulb. Uh, if you see, um, there's a an infrared emitter and an um, infrared receiver. In fact, there's there's a, a visible and infrared and a receiver. That one of those, and I don't know which one is is which, but one of those is actually um, emitting infrared that drives the camera. And so you set it to the camera's infrared setting, and it, tri it triggers that. It doesn't have another. It doesn't have a, a cable, so you can't plug it into the cable release, which is a shame. It would be really nice if it did. Um, but because it needs one of it's, it's only got two outputs, one for the flash and one for the, um, you know, for the, for the solenoid. So it uses infrared to drive the camera for the third one. And that's why I've got it dangled over in front of the camera so that it can actually, you know, that the, the camera can see it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it looks like the Pluto triggers are made differently for different cameras. Uh, they have different cables, and they have different software to drive them. Okay. The only, the, I mean, if you buy one for a, ki a kit, the, the, the key is you get a cable that matches your camera. The actual trigger itself, I believe, is common. It's only the, the cables okay. that differ. Yeah, but you're okay. right, there are kits for different cameras. Okay. Yeah, that's so good to know. Um, okay. Because so cool. it, it will, if you're not using the solenoid, then you can use the output that's driving the solenoid to drive the camera. It's just that it's only got two outputs, and I need three. So it does the third one with the, with the infrared. Right. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So how do we? So now you've got all that uh, spaghetti nest of wires plugged in. You've yes. got your strobe yes, set up. You've tested yep. that. 
how, so this, let's uh, go over how you set up the the drop timing and actual sure. triggering and everything. Okay. So um, let's go back to me for a second. Actually, you know, probably live view is as good a one as any. So as I said, I, I set the drops up so that they're dropping directly onto the um, uh, onto the top of the bolt, and then I have a um, an app on my phone. Let me just unplug power from it so I can move my phone around. And this app is what controls everything. And you'll see that there's uh, four different timings here, and then there's a further two on the second screen. And so the four timings, the first one is the flash delay. That's from the point that the the, the clock starts and the camera, sorry, the, the, um, the Pluto trigger tells the camera to open the shutter. How long do you want to wait after that before you fire the flash? Now, that's the moment at which you're going to get the actual image. So the image is entirely illuminated by the flash, um, which means you have to be in a relatively dark room. Um, and I mean, I'm sitting at uh, looking at, uh, I'll be coming at probably 0.6 of a second exposure. Um, the second time then is the timing for the first droplet. And it, it tells it how long to leave the valve open in order to allow water to flow before, uh, you know, just to create the first droplet. And that droplet starts when the clock starts. So basically, there's no ability to delay that, that initial droplet. Um, the third uh, no, number there where it says 103, that's the delay from the end of the first droplet to the beginning of the second droplet. And then the fourth one, the 10 milliseconds, is how long do you hold the valve open for the second droplet? So you see my first droplet is significantly bigger than my, my second droplet. And the reason is because the first droplet is the one that, that's going to create the column. The second droplet is the one that's going to create the splash on, and hit the top of the column. And then once I go crazy, then I can go to the third one. And now I've got, again, another delay of how long after the end of the second droplet before I start the third droplet. And then how long do I hold the valve open for the third droplet? I think you said drop it like 27 times in that description. Probably. Yeah, I think that's a record. So <laughs> drop it. So and then and then so you're just doing a long exposure. You're just going to open Correct. the shutter, and you're then because yeah. you basically want to do this in a in a darkened environment, and Correct. so only the strobe is lighting everything. So you're shooting at like what yep. f eight f f eleven something like that. I'm, I'm shooting I'm shooting at f twenty because I need the depth. Oh, of even focus. higher. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm shooting with the um, with a long exposure, probably 0.6 of a second. Um, I, you know, I started a second, but I can get away with 0.6 and still just catch everything, and it's real. It's hit and miss. Okay. And then um, I'm shooting at ISO 800, and that allows me to keep the strobe really, really low. So the the final thing is you can obviously control. Uh, the light with the power of the strobe. The problem is that the longer, the higher the power on the strobe, the longer the strobe flash lasts. And as that lasts longer, you start to see movement in, in the, um, the right. droplet. So if you want the droplets to be as sharp as possible, you need the, dro the flash to be really, really short duration. Right, which is ideally why, you know, if you have um, speed lights, speed lights are like, you know, 20,000th of a second kind of, kind of duration exactly. anyway. You don't really yeah. have to worry about that, but you're using a studio light I'm That's using why a studio light, keep the but, it power uses, down. but it uses speed light. Um, the you know the, 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 a lot of the modern um, studio lights use the same technology as speed lights, so they're as fast. But I've just got a lot more power. It's um, and I mean I forget the exact time, but I'll tell you if I look on the strobe. Um, it's telling me that my t point one, which is the time taken to get down to one tenth of the output, is one eight thousandth of a second. So, so it's pretty damn quick. If you look at the uh, t point five, that's going to be close to a twenty thousand. Yeah, photogenic but, lights, the flash duration is one thirteen hundredth to one six hundred and fortieth of a second. So That's right. Those are the old capacitor based uh, yeah. lights. And they're great for lighting people and they're horrible for lighting uh, droplets yeah. because they take forever. The the new light switch uh, with the uh, you know with the, the modern uh, you know track technology are a hundred times faster. Yeah. Um, and so I mean I, I have photogenics and, and you're absolutely right and they're very 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 slow. They they produce beautiful light but you know not not good for this. Okay, so um, let's see this, some photos. These are comparable to a speed light. Yeah, let's see this thing work. Cool. Ready? Well, you've got a couple. Yep. Do you want to? Uh, let's 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 have you let's have you do a couple and then I'll show some images sure. of what it should look like. <laughs> okay. We'll see. We'll see how close you get. <laughs> and you're interfacing right now with using Capture One. Correct. Yeah. So that was taken still with the bolt in, and if I just hit play on that, uh, I think it'll. No, it won't show it. Um, 
I'll have to switch to a different capture one screen. Uh, you know what, I can share my capture one screen. Um, but actually, if I take the bolt out, let's take the bolt out and then we can see what happens. Now that we know we're focused. Yeah, because ultimately uh, what we're looking at doing is creating images like this Correct. where, okay, that's got the bolt in there, but eventually yeah. we'll take the bolt out and we'll start to see this scenario happen. And then, yeah. oops, and then we'll just break it. So I'll just like jump out of my folder. <laughs> That is, um, I'm not the only one that happens to. So the goal, but the goal is going to be is that you you're able to time not only that splash, and I'm just talking about one droplet. So you'll be able to time the yeah. splash, and where that second and third droplet could come into play later. So you can get you can exactly get quite quite sophisticated with it. Okay. So I'm going to turn the second splash off for a second, uh, for a moment. So while um, while you're doing that, anybody that's in the in the in the group here hanging out, you know, welcome everybody that, that piled in. I know we got like 15 or 20 people in there. Um, at the bottom of your screen is a Q and A panel. Uh, feel free to throw me any questions that you want in there. And then I'll just either feed those to Nick as we're going and have him answer those. Um, you guys are also allowed to chat amongst yourselves. You're allowed to make fun of Nick in the chat. You're not allowed to make fun of me. And uh, I think you got that the wrong way around, Troy, but it's close. <laughs> nice try. And, uh, you know, just to be fair, uh, I, I get I get a transcript of all the text messages. So <laughs> <laughs> private or otherwise, just so you know, Brad, yeah. not, not picking on anybody. <laughs> all right. So you've pulled the bolt out. And so now we're going to do is we're going to try to get some some timing. So okay, now we so get I'm to see a couch. Now we're looking at capture one, and these are just a couple that I, this is what I just shot now. Now at the moment, I'm only shooting with a single um, dropper. So if you, if I, uh, Troy, you're gonna have to help me. How do I get that to go? Oh, there we go. Double click on it. Um, come back, not that big. There we go. So that was, and that was a lucky happenstance. We happened to get that beautiful, you know, pinnacle with a, with a drops t sitting on top of it. Uh, I'd love to tell you that happens every time, but that would be a lie. Um, okay, yeah, there you go. I told Troy, every you know, you get about one in three that it, it, it works. There's, there's little bits that are a bit hokey, so there we go. And we should get one coming in now. Okay, there'll be a short pause while light, oh, sorry, capture one does its thing. Uh, there we go. So it looks like I'm getting fairly consistent timing on that. And that's just with a single drop. Now, if you notice that, uh, I don't know if you can see where my mouse is, but you see these little yep. streaks. That's because the sun is setting and my garage face west. So it's as dark as I can get it in here, but it's it's hotter than Hades. And, and no, that's my problem, but, but, but I can't get those to completely go away. And that's just a little bit of movement. Once it gets darker, uh, then it'll get better. Now I do have a black uh, black backdrop behind to block out most of the light, but there's still a little bit of, of residual light, and that's really what you're seeing. There's just a bit of movement. This is this is a toy that's best played with after dark. So um, before you make any changes to this, um, yeah. let's just you know having going back to the settings on the camera. Let's say that we want that droplet, the top one, to be higher, mm -hmm. to be further away, right? So the yeah. first one went and made the splash, and the second one fell. Is that what that is? No, that's actually just a single droplet. Oh, that's, that's a, a single, single droplet. droplet. Okay, we haven't yeah. done the second droplet yet. We haven't okay. done the second. That's a single drop that is jumping up and producing a column, and it happens that it's it's uh, the timing is such that it's producing that little drop on top, and it's doing it fairly consistently. And this is the same look. If you if you remember, uh, you know, Swanson was able to achieve that same look. This is what would have happened if you had all three uh, firing. So that's one I did a little bit uh, just a few minutes ago. Okay, because what uh, I'd love to you see you do that. now is we've done we've done a single droplet and we see how yep. that works. Let's do us yep. let's do two droplets and then that way okay. we can understand how the settings in the Pluto trigger can make those differences because that's where it could get really frustrating for somebody who's never played with this. Is now you got to oh, sit yes. down and be like, okay, which way do I go with the numbers? So this is the second. Um, there'll be a short pause and then there we go. Here is the. Uh, bring in a second drop. And um, it's timed so that it hits the column as the column is coming up. 
Now, one of the things that's different, these, these are still essentially black and white. It's just a white light uh, with a black on the side. Uh, what I did with the one that you showed earlier was I then put a red backdrop down, and I'll do that a bit later. But that sure. just changes color. And then there's another thing I want to do with, with playing around with the background. After so this, let's but... dissect this image for a second. Yep. So this is two drops. Yep. So the first one hit splash, the column comes up. The second one has come right. down and crashed into that column. So let's make a change to this, explain what that change is, and then let's see the example of the change. Got it. So um, if I can find the right button here, where's the picture and picture button? There we are. Uh, with any luck, you should see... Um, Okay, you should start to see my uh, screen, uh, my, my phone, uh, iPad, uh, iPhone in the corner. Did that work? No. Okay. Oh, never mind. It was a nice idea. Um, oh, no, because I'm sharing the screen. That's that's why. Yeah. So what I've done here is I've changed the... Um, You're okay. still sharing the screen. Yep. No, that's okay. That's what I want. So I'll show you that this is, those are the settings that I had on the, I, uh, oh no, you, you're not gonna see that either. Okay, uh, I, what I did was I changed the, the timing and I reduced the delay from 103 milliseconds down to 96. Um, and as you see, it's basically hitting earlier. So it's kind of trashing the column. And uh, what we're seeing now is we're late in the game um, with, the, you know, with the light. Uh, and what I can do is, let me make that 95 so it'll count correctly. And then I'm going to have it increase in steps of two milliseconds. And uh, we'll start to see a progression. So which setting uh, are you changing on your phone? So I'm changing the delay between the first and second drop. The drop size remains the same. I'm purely and simply changing the delay so that it gets two, two milliseconds later each time. We're up to 101, now we're up to 103. And I'll stop in a second to let Lightroom play catch up. I'm sorry, uh, Capture One play catch up. Uh, just pause it for a moment. And uh, now that we're up to, that's actually at 105, but if I step back up to the previous uh, couple, so we'll go back up to, Three, one, ninety-nine, ninety-seven, ninety-five. So that was at ninety-five milliseconds. That was at ninety-seven. This was at ninety-nine. One hundred and one, and you start to see that we're moving. One hundred and three. One hundred and five. And you see, we're essentially moving back in time. In other words, we're seeing the the, the, um, the plate bit less uh, developed and less sprayed out because of the fact that the, the drop is hitting later. I haven't changed the timing on the um, flash, which defines when you actually look at it. Um, let's leave that where that is for a moment. And now I'm going to go and change the delay uh, for the flash. And I'm going to start bringing that later. Um, in order the uh, sorry, earlier, I beg your pardon. Uh, so I'm going to go back um, here. Let me just change this. And then we're going to go back. I'm going to go back um, 20 milliseconds earlier. So, so you're changing the timing on the flash. Nothing that's else. Correct. Yep. yep, that's exactly it. And then I'm going to increase it in steps of two. Uh, no, no, not 29. Um, and, you know, There we go. Now we got it, it uh, fired up. The flash goes to sleep, which is part of the problem. But uh, here we are. So it's sitting there. And the nice thing about this system is that with the ability to control uh, things and set these sequences, once you figure out, once you get close, you can just sit it, you know, let it sitting there and just let it run. And I mean, you produce ungodly numbers of images. I'll be honest. Okay, we're not seeing but, any of your images in your share screen because you're going faster no. than it's drawing them. I know it's it, it's 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 playing catch up, but uh, I will go back and. So that was where we were at uh, 402, and we were clearly too we were late in the game. This went back to um, 400, and I have to do the math, but 400 and change, and then I've stepped forwards. And if you look, each time I'm stepping forwards, the, the, um, uh, the plate is a little further developed. And now it's starting to fall away, and you see it's starting to, you know, to, to droop. 
And as you that's, get further, you're just you catching, the based on the timing of the strobe, you're just simply catching the splash happening earlier in that's the crash. Exactly. Yep. Okay. That's exactly it. So you're watching time effectively, you're watching the the flash the splash evolve over time. And um, you know, if I can get Lightroom to actually complete the job within some appro approximate light, uh, time frame, I'll actually produce a time lapse of this. I've done a whole series of time lapses, but um, as we talked about earlier, Lightroom has become so slow that it's just it's taking forever to do that. But you know, I can then essentially just move from before the drop hits all the way through to the point that the the, the splash has essentially deteriorated. Let's and that's do what that. I've been doing. Let's try it before the the splash hit. So we're gonna move the sure. we're gonna move the timing of the strobe yep. even earlier, just to exaggerate yep. the example. Sure. Okay. So I'm gonna go all the way back to three fifty oh, seconds, which should be way early, and then I'm gonna increase in steps of ten, not eighteen, ten milliseconds, and I'm gonna increase the delay to seven so that it gives the camera uh, the uh, capture one with any luck. It will give it enough time to play catch up. There we go. Okay. Oh yeah. So that's going to be way. So if you look at if you just look at the, the the thumbnail in the corner, you'll see it. And there you see just the column. And the column's getting bigger. And bigger. And now we've got one where you see the droplet just about to hit. So that's a collision waiting to happen. And then we're step past, and stop at that point. So now we've seen the first couple of collisions. Got it. I was taking much bigger steps. I'm taking 10 more second steps just because you now otherwise we'll be here forever. Right, right. Yeah, believe me, I've done that. So, so you know that's, me, I've, I've, that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, so I've sound watched them. So now, at, now at this point, we let, let's say that we like we like our timing, we like the collision where it's at. You know, we like you know it's consistent, and we're happy with that creation. Uh, how how do we get color in there, and how do we light it to create more diversity? Because let's, I mean, let's be honest. Like if we all if we all had a, a Pluto trigger right now, we're playing with it. We're all going to get to this pretty quick, right? Yep. So how do we make this unique? Like, what does Nick do to make his images look different than Swanson's photos? So the first thing is this, because um, it's just it's just way cooler in red. Um, now I've got some I've got some droplets and froth and stuff that appeared on the surface of the water, and I would clean that off as well. Um, but that starts to get interesting. Now the second thing that I do is I'm going to add in um, a third droplet. And this gets interesting, uh, and this is where this is where having the three valve system is a big advantage, because I'm asking the valve to, to fire three times in very close succession, and the timing gets funky, and so it may or may not, and this gets get to be somewhat hit and miss. Um, and the timing of the flash is crucial here, uh, and I haven't quite got it right yet. So one of the things that's really cool about this, if you're doing it uh, after dark, if you actually watch it for, long as, for as long as you're not epileptic, um, you can see that because it's illuminated by flash, you actually see the drop suspended in the air. And you can get that, you know, use your, your eye as a camera effectively. Um, and, and watch it. It's kind of a weird thing to do, but it actually really works. Um, and so I found that I was able to get pretty close most of the time, uh, just purely and simply um, you know, by watching uh, the, the thing, and you know, you see where it is. Now, I also did one other thing that helps a lot, and that is, um, I used my um, iPhone to photograph the or to film the drops using the slow mo um, version of the um, uh, in, in the iPhone. And here you see, there's a couple of uh, residual splashes. I've lost my my third drop, and I don't know where it's gone. Uh, and it's too bright to see it um, with my eyes. But anyway, th so the, the third one, I'll, I'll figure out where I put my timings in a minute and get back to that. Um, with a lot of moving parts, you can imagine that um, it gets So tricky. with somebody 
somebody new with this, I know that we've got some uh, water drop veterans in the chat or, you know, in the group watching, but for somebody new, what would be, uh, you know, like your top three tips, things that they really need to focus on when they're setting this up to not get frustrated? Because it seems like you've got a lot of moving parts, a lot of configurability, uh, and it could get really frustrating quickly. Uh, drink heavily? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it, it's you're right. It can get very frustrating. It's it, the the main thing is to be um, slow and methodical. Don't try and get everything to go to go in one hit. You have to do it in pieces. Um, so get the first drop right. Get the column of water right. Um, I use, as I say, I use the iPhone to film it um, and in slow mo, and it's actually really cool. You get to see. Um, what it does i you know i'm not sure if i can get that to work for you but um so what you're saying is you're just you're just filming it in slow motion with the phone without exactly. triggering the flash or without firing the camera that's exactly i'm literally just, just watching the drop oh, no, that, i'm fucking that won't work um and we'll see and whether i may even be able to show you what i shot yesterday because here we go so somewhere in amongst this lot um No, not that one. I can't see my screen, but uh, is that did that? That's running. Sorry about the flickering for anybody that's uh, did. Oh, there we go. And so it's interesting. The dropper always produces my, my particular valve always produces that little secondary droplet, and I wonder whether I was always having that secondary splash. And what's interesting is it always fires in the same direction. So if you watch as it drops out. Yeah, that's t it's tearing off of the the lip of that exactly. brass. So yeah. you yeah, can so you see it, and you get that little second secondary droplet every single time, and it it always goes off slightly to the right. So I'm sure that if I were to file the uh, and clean up the edge of the the valve, it would get a little better. Yeah, and you um, can also put a put a uh, a toothpick in there, like a toothpick or something that, that oh it, it pen. Can that's a good idea to give it a, a pen one. or yeah, something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there it is. Or you could just time. switch to a cup because I think a plastic cup with a big needle didn't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. But but uh, I mean you know I I'm all for you know applying technology when you can and this was one where it was actually really helpful and uh, just that, that allowed me to see what was going on um, and then somewhere. Um, Yeah, I, I, I can't find the, I have to go back a ways. Here we are. Yeah, so, so these are some of my earlier experiments. And um, you can see I've, done, I've been through a bunch of these. Yeah. Um, well, let's, yeah, well, let's, let's go back to looking at the, um, but, uh, the overall setup one more time, because that's just yeah. kind of a, a good refresher. Yep. Yeah, if you can, like, zoom back and show us the the whole setup there. Now, can you do a shot from here so that we can just kind of watch how the whole process happens, uh, sure. not through the camera, but just kind of seeing what what's going on here? Okay, so let me. I'll get in as close as I reasonably. There we are. So we're underexposing the room light, so the room light's not even coming into play in this exposure because you said you're like F twenty yeah. at ISO eight. Yeah, I'm at F twenty. And um, I mean, the, the room, the, uh, with uh, this brightness, the room does come in a little bit, but not a whole lot. But right, uh, right. obviously, most of it I'm doing um, uh, after dark, and so it doesn't come in. But if I now fire it, I hit the button. And uh, OK, let's try that again and see if we can get the flash to fire. There we go. And that's the process. So you saw the drops went, the, the flash fired. Uh, I think the system caught the image. And then if we go back to. And how are you firing that? Are you firing it like from the Pluto trigger or from the camera? I'm, I'm, I'm pressing the yeah, I'm pressing the play button on the Pluto trigger. And how far away does that work? Like, could you be sitting in the living room right now, just taking picture after picture? <laughs> get, try and and you get... know, I'm not. I think it's uh, that's a good. I thought it was Wi-Fi, but I didn't see it joining a Wi-Fi. So that's actually I'm not. That's great. So you could just it. kick back and just hit that button until you get the splash that's perfect. Yeah, pretty much. No, it's it's over, it's over Bluetooth. So you're uh, within Bluetooth range. Oh, that's um, nice. That's nice. Yeah, which gives you, I mean, you've got 20, 30 feet. You haven't got 300, but uh, you've got enough that, that you get a, a good sense of it. So then the final thing that I was doing for adding some color to it and some fun, and this is stuff I've just been experimenting with, but it's kind of interesting, is 
this and it's still a work in progress but i thought it would be fun to play with um so now we'll combining we some of what, what what you have going on there with the control of the of the of the drops and what Swanson showed in his where he printed out those patterns that created really crazy patterns in the water. Yep. Um, so yeah, you can definitely combine those two. I can see the benefit for both of those. This one, how long did it take you to set this up? Uh, um, taking taking out the fact that you were setting up cameras for us to be able to see what you're doing. If you were just going to set this yeah. up for you, how long does that take? To get the to get the rig ready to start testing uh, was probably, I don't know, somewhere between half an hour, probably half, half an hour, 45 minutes. Okay. Um, you know, get, get everything, get the table set up and so on. To get it dialed in, that was a little longer. That's, that's a, um, you know, probably two or three hours of, uh, of tweaking to get everything tuned. And if you were if you were in a hurry and you were very methodical, you could probably get that done in, in an hour maybe. So it's a, it's a, it's a couple of hour investment to, before you start to get any usable images. So are um, the are the settings on the on the on the dropper than the controller the pretty consistent. So let's say that in this session you've recorded your timing that you like a lot and you break this yeah. all down and then a couple of weeks from now you go back are they going to be pretty close? Can you count on those? So should you be recording settings that work? You can for as long as the height of the dropper above the surface of the water is consistent. That's the number one, that's the big variable. But if the, if the height of the valve to the water is consistent, then everything else should be pretty much consistent because it's gravity. And last time I checked, that doesn't vary much. But uh, if, you, if you're off by even a small amount on the height of the uh, column, then things will change and they'll change fairly quickly. The, but the good news is that essentially it's the timing of the um, uh, the, the timing of the flash that is the critical one. Uh, that's you know because that's when you're right. going to get everything else. Because that now, stops the, the motion. The exactly so. Yeah. Now the timing of the drops relative to them relative to each other. Um, that's going to vary a little bit as well. But the, the big thing, if, you, if you've if you got a, an approximate idea, I mean, I know that I have it approximately a foot above the water, and I know what my rough settings are, so I can get close. Should be pretty consistent. I, you know, I've got a good starting point. But then you just go through methodically and record what happens with the um, you know, with the drops. Uh, the other thing that's also interesting, this is where if you've got a phone that will shoot in slow-mo, or any camera that will shoot in slow-mo, I would definitely recommend using that to, to get a sense of what the drops are actually doing. So I've videoed both the uh, drops coming out of the valve and then also the drops hitting the water. And when you see them hitting the water and you see the splash come back, it's interesting, there's actually two splashes. The first one comes up and produces a nice predictable column then goes back down and you get a much thinner but much taller column that shoots up. The problem is it shoots up in a random direction. So although I can time it to get the, the water to in the drop in the right place, the chances of hitting it are fairly low because it bounces around all over the place and it's much less predictable. Right, right. And what is your shutter speed again? You're you're nearly a second, right? I shutter, I'm at 0.6 of a second. Okay. And that's right on the limit. So and I did the way I got to that was I did the math with the amount of time uh, I mean I've got four hundred and sixteen milliseconds to the first um, you know, to the flash. Um, plus, I've got whatever time it took for the um, camera to respond to its uh, infrared and open the shutter. So I figured that was pretty close. That, that's I mean, you really could really have a really longer really shutter speed. It, it really doesn't matter as long oh, as you don't sure, get yeah. light yeah, contamination. I mean, exactly. For, if it's darker, then I can shoot at a second quite comfortably. But I've got video lights in here, plus I've got, um, you know, daylight. And so uh, that right. was, I just wanted to get as short as I could. Okay. All and right. if you so look you two shots up, you'll see here, um, it's really not completely dark in here. And that, that's what it looks like when the flash doesn't fire. Um, obviously, you know, once the sun goes down then, and I turn the lights off, then it, then it is completely dark and you get a little bit more saturation. Okay. And then Rebecca's asking about the water level. Does that affect your settings? Because in the, in the beginning, it, there's, a, there's a certain point that once the water level drops below yeah. a certain point, then it does. But for overall... So let me go back. To, I'll go back to the here. So let me stop sharing. And uh, am I sharing? No, I'm not sharing at the moment, am I? Well, you're showing your set. You're setting from the camera. Yeah, you're not sharing the screen. Oh, no, uh, okay. So that should be. Uh, let's go back to Zoom. Okay. Um, that's what we want. Yeah. So if you look at oh the water in the the water in the tray. 
Yeah. Uh, oh, is she talking about the water in the tray? Yeah. I, I don't would just change that... the timing when the water actually, I mean, when the drop yeah, actually hits the water. Yeah, I don't think that makes a difference. So... Um, now, if the water is very shallow, then the drop will behave differently. I've got deep, deep enough water that it behaves like a deep water splash. If it's a really, really shallow uh, thing, then you get a nice, ex uh, exciting explosion, but you don't get the, the burst coming back up. Because that happens basically when the sh the, the, the shock wave uh, you know, comes back, uh, you know, bounces back off the the inside inside surfaces. So yeah, if it, if it was you know like a um, you know an eighth or a quarter inch uh, deep, then yeah, the splash will look good. The, the 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 column coming back up will look very different. So let's go back to the the shots that you were doing with the aluminum foil because you really only showed us one of those. So let's let's have a look at those yeah. and see what that looks like. Okay. Um, go back to show and capture one. So uh, okay. Anastasia is asking, does the depth of your water tray related to the height of the the pinnacle aspire does that does that matter? Because what we it, it matters some. I think there's a point after which it doesn't matter. But if it's too shallow, then it does make a difference. But if it's once it gets deep, it doesn't matter if it's you know. Um, I mean, in my case, it's about an inch and a half deep, and I don't think it matters whether it's that or a foot deep. I don't think that will materially change things. Right. Right, because after about a, a foot and a half, the water doesn't fall any faster. Exactly. So the height, I mean, the, the height doesn't make uh, make much um, much difference, but also the depth of the water below um, doesn't make it. I haven't tried doing it in a bucket, and that would be an interesting test to see how that compared. Um, I'm going to change the timing back a little bit. So where is your blue light coming from? I've got a blue flash off to one side. Let me go back to the, here, I'll stop sharing for a second. I'll show you what I brought in. Um, if you look here, you see you see the aluminum foil. What you didn't see was this guy here. And I've got another. Whoops, that's going the right way. Okay. So I brought in a second flash there, and that guy's got a blue gel on him. So I'm reflecting that off the aluminum the aluminum foil, in order to create some interesting sort of specular light uh, and create some highlights. Yeah. Now, Rebecca's asking about whether or not it's easier to handle the color during the shoot or post. I think that you've got to have some color in there because otherwise it's only pure black and white. You could colorize it, yeah. but um, it, the way that you're doing there, I think, is, is probably going to be simpler, right? Yeah. I mean, that way you have I color. Because so. I, what I do is when I'm photographing splashes or, or ice, I put two colors, two differing colors, usually a red and a blue, so that yeah. I can grab that color channel later and then i can shift those hues into any color i want if it's just straight right. monochromatic then you kind of got to paint the color in yeah exactly yeah i mean if, if we just go back to, to the black and white images that we shot earlier um with this i mean it's a nice cool image but you're right you, you'd be doing a lot of you'd be doing a lot of work to, to be able to add color to that yeah um, and it's not going to look as natural right no right uh and it, it's i mean it's nice and it produces a metalized look now one of the things that um as a commercial photographer, I would never sh uh, photograph a shiny object with a matte field because that makes the water look matte. And I would have some lines, similar to what Swanson did, have some hard lines there to show the sharp reflections. In this case, since I actually want that sort of, I wanted that smooth, um, almost matte surface of the water so that the, sh the, the shininess of the drop actually shows out. So that's why I've got the, um, you know, the transform at the back because it gives that. And then when you add the color and it gets even better, you know, it just gets richer. Um, but then, with the, um, uh, the 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 tinfoil, let's go back to this one. It's a prettier. Uh, actually, no, it's just as nice. With, with the tinfoil, what I'm doing because I, I'm not doing the thing that Swanson does of actually showing that as an out of focus bokeh in the background, but I'm I'm using that to bring in uh, some blue light, reflected light, but it's specular and it's in specific spots. So you see just little areas of, of blue. And if I, I haven't got a third strobe set up with a gel at the moment, but I would bring in uh, a third uh, strobe from the other side, also pointing at the, um, the aluminum foil to create another set of, of, of lights and you can just add more color. So what color would you add to this if you wanted a secondary color? I'd probably bring in yellow. Yellow, um, yeah, I think yellow would be complement. Yeah, complementary to the blue, it gives you it gives you plenty to get a hold of, and uh, as you said, if you want to go and colorize it afterwards. But I think it yep. would add a, a, a really nice touch. I think green would probably not go well with the red, with this red being a sort of having a slight magenta cast to it. 
Um, I was gonna I was gonna say green would actually work really good because when you mix green and magenta, you get an amazing uh, deep purple. So it does it does it actually would be okay. worth trying. But you know sure. that's where the experimentation comes in and the creativity comes in is is use whatever color you want, right? Get in there. Uh, you know, use flashlights yeah, sure. or constant lights on the on the on the aluminum foil too. But they have to be pretty bright. But that's where the strobes come in, because the main strobe is stopping. One, try hold that thought for one second. So the main strobe in this case is is stopping the flash. So any additional right. light that you have is really just adding color. So you can get away that's with exactly a lot of different it. things. Yeah. Yep. And since I happen to have a, I just realized I got a, a speed light sitting beside me. So, because it's live, we can do this. And we're going to be wrapping it up soon, guys. So if you have any questions, now's a really good time to get those in there. Okay, I'm a hand short of doing, I'm going to have to set this on auto repeat because uh, I don't have enough hands to do it without. But with any luck, if I can hold that in like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got a green. Okay. How does that look? Uh, no, your other strobes didn't fire. Oh, wait, hang on. Maybe you got another one coming in. That's interesting. Why didn't I? Th okay, I must have turned something off. Um that's where they should have all fired. Okay. Yeah, Anastasia says it's time to dust off her triggers. Definitely. I don't even have triggers. <laughs> so. All right, where he's trying to get us a, a green light in there. Yeah, we don't really didn't see it in that one. But the point is that having a gel pack is not expensive. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you don't have a big studio light like what Nick has, uh, look at what um, David Swanson did. He just used two speed lights or two small strobes sit off on an angle, like a 45 degree angle lighting in the background. So you can experiment with different, different strobes, different reflectors, all those kind of things. Okay, yeah, the, the, the speed light's being overpowered by the two studio lights, unfortunately. Got it. I see a little uh, bit of green in there, which is, yeah, you I know mean, what? sometimes we'll that's get the some, We'll get a bit of drag, but let's, let, you know, go on, let's just go for gold. Give me a second. Just give it. Okay. So the speed light will be a little slow. We might see a bit of movement in this, but at least we'll see what the color looks like and we can see whether the, the concept works. Okay. So okay. Firing the green. Do we get any green on that one? Yeah, a little bit. You can yeah. see it in the highlights. So you can see you can see the concept. Yeah. But yeah, now you cool. can see how this can become an unbelievable time suck. Because there's just so many things to play with. Yeah. 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 Just set it up and leave it up for a while, and then experiment yep. and play and change change That's your backgrounds exactly. and change your, yep. your reflectors and one light on light from the side light from underneath you know yeah i did a transparent so, tray and lit it from underneath the tray that was pretty cool too i played with that and that you're right that does get pretty cool um i was doing it with just um uh, one of the um uh trays from the kitchen right uh, my wife wasn't overly impressed but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> we've been married for, for over 25 years i think we can get it you know our marriage can survive that but you can see even with some of these shots here, and uh, try. I sent you some images earlier from my earlier shoots, but uh, um, these are some of the things that I've yeah, been... these are way better. Yeah, these really show the progress and yeah. We and this is you know, see, this is shot after dark, so you know I've got the much greater saturation, and and then you really get to see it um, and so on. Perfect, perfect. Well, uh, uh, so Nick, why don't we go ahead and bring you back on camera? Sure. Okay. Awesome. So, thank you for doing that. That's a that's a lot, and and I and I realize like in this in this hour 
that we've spent doing this that it goes by pretty quick and it looks pretty easy but that took you several hours to set up uh, oh, yes. getting that all dialed uh hopefully hopefully you won't tear it down right away hopefully you'll use it for you oh. and <laughs> you create some more images. Yeah, no I'm, de I'm definitely gonna have some fun so the things that i want to do and i know swanson talked about this a little bit as well is i want to put some gelatin into the um into the mix because that creates much longer tendrils so i'll put the gelatin into the uh tube uh, and that way, the splash when it comes out, you get these mu much longer tendrils coming out. Um, right. The, the jump obviously has a you know holds together more. I want to play around with the lighting some more and see what I can do there. Um, I'm almost almost tempted to put one of my under underwater strobes in the water, but that's probably going a bit silly. Nah, try um, it. Try it in the bucket. But, uh, uh, the <laughs> underwater exactly. lighting is is actually pretty cool because it, yeah. it it does feel differently. Um, so if anybody wants to, to follow Nick, to see where Nick's at and see some of your work, how would they, where would they do that? Uh, look at uh, images, www.imagesbynick.photography. And I'm going to put some of the shoot, some of the images from this lot up there. I'm going to put a, uh, there's a section called fine art and I'll put a, a section in there called drops and splashes. So check that out and you'll see that I'm also on Facebook and Instagram images by Nick photography. And on Instagram, I have two dot photography and dot portraits image by nick dot portraits is um some of my more conventional portraits and image by nick dot photography some of my edgier stuff with wastelanders and the like yep and you're gonna you're gonna send me those links so i get the spelling correctly and i will put them in the description I will on do the that. youtube channel so if, if you. nobody if nobody got that we'll make sure that that's in there sure. um next week uh that will be what are we in we're in may june so june 3rd Next week, we're going to have Tim Ingle, uh, who is a fashion photographer and commercial photographer out of Northern California and a good friend of mine. He will be at F64 this year, and he was at F64 last year. He's going to really talk about uh, fine art human portraiture. So he's going to talk about his models that he comes in, the body painting that he does. He's got them wrapped in gauze. He's got them covered in mud. He's got them painted. And those are his that that is a lot of his personal artistic stuff that he likes to do. So we're going to talk a lot about the art of photography and trying to stay creative and then why he does this with the humans that he does and kind of the the dark side of Tim. Tim has a very, very dark. Uh, I think he would be a warlock if he could. <laughs> he does some wow. crazy stuff. So we will have we will have Tim next week. So that'll be great. So you guys check that out. All right. I, I thank you, Nick. I thank everybody for being here. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I'm going to stop the recording. So everybody have a safe week and get out there and create something.